Okay, may we begin? Good afternoon. I'm Xu Jian Kuo, acting director of the Institute for the Study of Humanity Buddhism in University of the West. Today, it is my great privilege to introduce Dr. Matthew W. King and his book, Ocean of Milk, Ocean of Blood, a Mongolian monk in the ruins of the Qing Empire. To our university faculty, staff, students, and also friends of a broader Buddhist community. Dr. King currently is the associate professor in Transnational Buddhism of the Department of the Religious Studies in University of California, Riverside. He got his PhD degree from University of Toronto in 2014. Through the book, he will talk to us today. We will travel back to early 20th century Mongolia and witness how a scholar, scholar monk defend his monastic tradition against the flood of so-called progressive modernization in any Asian society and country during that period. His work was received American Academy of Religion Award for the excellency in the study of a religion textual study in 2020. I personally believe Dr. King's study of counter-modern Buddhist monastic thought and the practice should provide an alternative perspective of studying modern Buddhism development in our own research work, particularly for our monastic students in University of the West. Now, without further delay, let's invite Dr. King to his podium and talk about his book. Dr. King. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Kuo. And thank you so much to um, the Institute for the Study of Humanistic Buddhism, for the Department of Religious Studies and for the University of the West for the opportunity um, to connect and, and speak about this, this work. It's a great privilege. Um, what I'd like to do, I'll just share my screen, is open my presentation um, in the way that I did with uh, the book, with a little vignette that I think sets the scene for my study. Okay, there we go. <clears throat> One summer's day, deep in the monastic city of Ihuri, or modern-day Ulaanbaatar, the spiritual friend who pleases Manjugosa took his seat in front of an assembly at the Dharma College of Das Chujoling. According to the only surviving record of events, he then delivered a teaching address to quote all Mongolian monks, lamas, gods, and protectors who are undifferentiated in their devotion here at the edge of time and place, end quote. His subject that day was a prophecy attributed to the enlightened Bodhisattva Manjushri in his successive human incarnations as the Manchu Emperor. There we go. It was the Manchu Emperor, we read, who was the central object of his audience's undifferentiated devotion that day. Heavily supplementing the root prophecy with his own interpretation, the appropriately named spiritual friend who pleases Manjugosa first reminded his audience that Manjushri had long ago picked China as his field of enlightened activity. In this telling, the Bodhisattva had emanated vast stretches of the Chinese landscape, so much dirt, rock, and mud, to the south of Mongol territory and to the east of Tibet, most prominently the holy pilgrimage site of Wutaishan and that exceedingly beautiful, sorry, quote, exceedingly beautiful great city called Beijing, end quote. In addition to emanating enchanted geography such as these, the spiritual friend who pleases Manjugosa continued, long ago Manjushri had begun to more actively intervene in human affairs by taking on the fleshly bodies of notable men. The assembly heard how Manjushri had first taken form as that, quote, great chief of the gods, the Manchu Manjushri emperor, and then as an uncountable number of Tibetan and Mongolian living Buddhas. Draped in the robes of uh, monks and emperors, 
These manifestations have been seated on thrones at the center of, an imper of imperial and monastic complexes and had managed complementary spheres of authority across the mosaic of Mongolian, Manchu, Tibetan, and Han societies. These many Manjushris have for centuries engaged in the drama of exchanging precepts and titles and of establishing an abundance of legal, political, and religious frameworks for Haha, Oirat, Manchu, Buryat, Han, and all the various Tibetan societies. The mirror work of their activity had dressed the human stage for maximal security, peace, and soteriological possibility. Manifesting as constellations of sacred landscape as, as emperors and as monastic leaders, this teacher continued, Manjushri's intent had always remained singular, to unify the, quote, two systems of the Buddha's teachings uh, and politics, the Chusi Sundra in Tibetan, sort of twining of dharmic and secular rule and sovereignty. And in this, the monastic college of Das Chijirling, the surrounding mass, the monastic city of Ehuri, and the vast spread of monastic networks across Inner Asia were the clearest testimonies of Manjushri's success. In this telling that summer's day, the Qing formation was the culmination and perfection of a vast history of enlightened intervention in human affairs across all of Eurasia. Specifically, the Qing was, for this audience, inseparable in its religious and political expression from the Yellow Hat or the Geluk tradition, those monastic, scholastic, and tantric communities and spheres of affiliation that then wove across the Himalaya to Beijing, across all Mongolian societies, all Manchu societies, across Siberia, and in the early 20th century to St. Petersburg. Manjushri, in the guise of the Manchu emperor, this teacher emphasized, acted, quote, like a full moon on the crowns of the nine types of beings of China, Tibet, and Mongolia. And from that celestial position had continuously gathered like a cloud in the sky of, for, uh, of fortunate sentient beings and uninterruptedly reigned very white virtue and goodness. And so I summarize this scene of prophetic commentary here and also at the start of my book, not because of its content, which is of course quite typical of the 18th and 19th century and a little bit of the 17th century in such writing, not because of its content, but because of its timing. This Lama's public ode to a thriving Qing political and religious formation to histories, territories, and communities enchanted by enlightened presence and possibility within the Qing imperial order was delivered not in the 18th or 19th centuries, as we might suppose. Instead, those men and gods gathered at Dash Chujurling in the Wood Mouse Year, or 1924. By then, more than a decade had passed since the political collapse of the Qing. The quote-unquote enlightened Manchu ruling elite had long since been dethroned. Republican China was already a decade old. An autonomous Mongolian nation state had separated from the flailing Qing in 1911, and uh, Ihuri, later named Ulaanbaatar, had been its capital uh, for some eight years. More recently, in 1921, the urban environs where this ode to the Qing was proclaimed had been the staging ground for the founding of the world's second socialist nation, the Mongolian People's Republic. This Lama thus offered this laudatory teaching um, on the Qing Geluk formation in the present tense, at the heart of the world's second socialist nation, from a college now in the capital of its revolutionary government, and in an intellectual and political climate officially defined against imperial era suppression. What monk or god would gather to listen to such a message so out of step with political reality? So my book, in a way, is an attempt to answer questions like these. My aim is to access the content of the social imagination of Buddhist scholars grappling with Qing religiosity and history beyond the empire's political end, and also, though, beyond the totalizing teleological discourses of the modern and the nation. The content of that imagination, which had its day in Mongolia, which is the site of, site of this study, between the uh, Qing collapse in 1911 and the mass purge of monastics and monasticism in 1937, the record of that, this, this brief time, has been largely destroyed, uh, fragmented by party rhetoric, buried by state violence, excluded by revisionist Soviet-era historiography, 
repurposed in the mythologies of diaspora and refugee communities, and also exiled in geographies of academic knowledge about Buddhism, Asia, and its quote unquote modern history. So how, I set out to ask in these pages, were Buddhism, community, agency, and history written by monks, gods, and men, and not by Bolsheviks, citizens, or the sovereign individual in the ruins of a newly absent Qing? The stunning state violence of 1937 that ends this story um, has erased most of the traces of such writing. Uh, and I should say that in that year, in about 18 months, some 40,000, mostly monks, but others as well, uh, were, were executed. Hundreds of thousands of other monks were disrobed. And basically all except for all of the 700 or 800 or so monasteries and temples in Mongolia were destroyed other than three. So it was a really stunning and quick erasure of public Buddhism uh, in 1937. Um, as such, my book is necessarily a very granular picture of history and self and community making. I tell a story from the first person perspective of a singular, altogether exceptional monk working at the Tibetan Mongolian frontiers of Russia and China um, in the global cross currents of early 20th century Mongolia. And this figure is this person, Zawa Damdin Lobsan Damdin. Zawa Damdin was one of the most prominent and prolific Inner Asian Buddhist thinkers to have lived during the late and post Qing periods. A complicated historian, mystic, logician, pilgrim, and abbot who defies any easy categorization, Zawa Damdin would be memorialized by Soviet era historians as both Mongolia's first modern intellectual and its last feudalist ideologue. For post-Soviet Buddhist revivalists today in Mongolia, he was an exam the, the example of a lost age of golden, a golden age of Mongolian Buddhism. In my reading of his many works, however, and quite co controversially, he was instead an anxiety-driven monastic leader tasked unenviably with making sense of the upturned social hierarchies reversed forms of power and mobility, and disconnected cosmologies that lay scattered in the ruins of the Qing Empire. His massive written oeuvre, uh, which was unfinished and hidden away for dec decades in, uh, uh, under the bed, basically, of one of his uh, disciples, is the only collection of scholarly monastic writing of equal scope and purpose to have survived the state-inflicted infl terror of the 1930s. So these 417 texts in some 9,000 folios were all written in Tibetan, although they directly engage Mongolian, Chinese, Russian, and French, and even French sources very regularly, and of course Sanskrit ones as well, through the Tibetan translation. Um, and together this, this bundle of texts offer our only substantive sources on just what those men and gods understood in August of 1924 as they gathered at the feet of the spiritual friend who pleases, pleases Manjugosa, who, it turns out, was an epithet for Zawa Dandan himself. He was the one delivering this prophecy, this commentary. So my book is most concerned with two kinds of literary sources, um, wherein Zawa Dandan tried to set the Qing and the revolutionary modern into history. There's some 25 to 30 texts in about uh, 1,500 folios concerned with world history. Um, for anyone who reads Tibetan, these are in genres like Chujun or Logyu, Gyalrab, things like that. Um, and then three to four other texts um, in about 2,000 folios about his personal biography. My book was an attempt to rescue from these writings a picture of the enduring legacy of a Qing order of things that exceeded its political ending. And Dam um, Damden sought desperately, I found, to reconstitute that lost order so as to continue reproducing the Buddha's religion in Manjushri's abandoned mandala. His labor, uh, I discovered, was profoundly dialogical, and he was in sustained conversa uh, conversation with actors as diverse as the 13th Dalai Lama, so the previous Dalai Lama, with revolutionary soldiers, with Russian Buddhologists like Sherbatsky and uh, Tubiansky, with many Tibetan monastic scholars, with radical intellectuals, with Chinese monks, with tantric yogis, and even with members of the Bakhtin school in Russia. 
The thousands of pages he left is a curious topography. They inscribe a social and religious imagination quite apart from what we know from state archives, certainly in Mongolia. They are reducible to neither tradition nor to the modern, to religion or science, to monasticism or feudalism, or to something like revolutionary progress. But it took me a very long time to figure out that this was precisely, uh, it was precisely in such ambiguity that this project uh, would lay, uh, ended up um, unfolding. So I first kind of made contact with Zaladamdin and with his, um, his legacies, uh, actually before even graduate school, when I accompanied a Tibetan Lama to, um, who undertook a long teaching tour of Gobi Desert villages. Uh, and at that time, I began spending, um, began spending time in Buddhist revivalist communities across Mongolia. This was about 2006. Though I knew nothing about Zawadamdin when I embarked on that first trip, um, it happened that our host while in country was this Lama, um, Guru Deva Rinpoche. Pardon me, Guru Deva had been at the heart of the uh, of revival and preservation of inner Asian monasticism for decades. First in the Tibetan diaspora in India in the 1960s, and then in Kathmandu in Nepal, and then after 91 when he could, could travel uh, and return uh, to Mongolia. And it was in the 1970s that Gur Deva Rinpoche had collected and published the 17 volume Sungbum or collected works of Zawadamdin from his exile base in Kathmandu. And this became the basis um, of, my, of my book. Um, and so when I arrived in Ulaanbaatar in 2006, Gur Deva Rinpoche's residence was a throughway for hundreds of people involved in reviving Buddhist institutions and public ritual traditions, not only in Mongolia, but also in, in China. From visiting Tibetan lamas to sumo wrestle, uh, wrestlers, oracles sputtering in trance, to Mongolian gangster rappers, it seemed like endless stream, uh, sorry, endless streams of monks and lay people and funders and patrons from across Asia filed endlessly into Guru Deva Rinpoche's uh, residence. And one of the most prominent members of this entourage was a monk named uh, Losam Darja, uh, or Losam uh, Dargya in, in Tibetan, who is considered to be the current incarnation of Zawa Damda, Damdan, who ended up being the protagonist of my book. During that summer and over five or six subsequent trips, I spent a great deal of time with this Lama and with his monks in apartment temples in Ulaanbaatar, at his revived Gobi monastery there, um, and in many town halls, grasslands, and sandy ruins across the Gobi, all the way down uh, to the Chinese border. And so appropriately enough, uh, I suppose, I came to his previous incarnation, Zawa Damdin's revolutionary era of historical writing from this current incarnation. Um, and during my first two visits, uh, I witnessed um, the current incarnation widely distributing modern Cyrillic Mongolian translations of some important histories written by his predecessor. And though I'd been studying, um, uh, sorry, uh, let me just skip over that, right. Um, and so the, those Cyrillic translations specifically were being distributed in sort of Buddhist Bible camps, basically. They were mimicking the successful Korean Christian Bible camps that were winning converts in Mongolia at the time. And Zawa Rinpoche would take um, this new coveted class of urban youth, the sort of the children of the emerging upper middle class from the city down to the desert and basically treat them how to be um, patrons. Um, of, uh, of monks, how to be um, faith sort of uh, virtuous patrons, virtuous lay people, and specifically a very kind of blood and soil type narrative around you are Mongol, you are of this earth, therefore you are Buddhist, and, um, and then engaging in group studies of these histories from this previous incarnation. And so uh, over the course of my doctoral work and then in this book, I decided to try and use Zawa Damdan's writing from this revolutionary period from which we knew very little about the content of social and religious imagination of monks, I decided, decided to look at these writings um, as a basis for a revisionist or even radical microhistory of the Qing socialist transition. And eventually I came to realize as a kind of critique of modernist presumptions that remain beholden to the national subject in the plotting of post-imperial history in Eurasia, and this is certainly true of 
some of the ways we think about Buddhism in the quote unquote uh, modern period. Okay, so let me go back to Dawa Dandan's life and, the, uh, and his project. So my first task in trying to make sense of these works was to understand the multiplicity of forms of historical and social imagination that were at play during the Qing collapse and the rise of revolutionary government in Mongolia. So in the 1910s and 20s and 30s. Against the enduring authority of the Qing era Buddhist religious establishment, the fledgling socialist state in Mongolia, uh, which is founded in 1921, remained contingent. It occupied a liminal position between enacting direct military action against Buddhist monasteries and having the authority to, to impose the rule of law. A fundamental question or sort of a fundamental problem facing the first, this first project at socialist state building in Asia was glossed by revolutionary cadres at the time as the Lama question, as the Lam Naren Asudo in Mongolia. While early revolutionary leaders worked closely with monastic leaders like Sawadandan, or else were themselves prominent Buddhist monks and lay literati, the majority of monasteries and their elite monks opposed the centrifugal forces of reform that were being advanced by the socialist government. Examples of reform initiatives at the time, just to give you a kind of paint a quick picture, ranged from public health campaigns all the way to staging European theater for uh, apparently unimpressed rural Mongols, introducing secular education, Mongolian language publications, so trying to decenter the sort of control of the Tibetan language in Mongolia, um, and of course developing industry, uh, reforming agriculture, and most problematically for monks, tax, uh, taxing the very rich monastic estates. Nonetheless, even after many years, such reforms failed to provoke a mass awakening of class consciousness. The number of monks actually grew over the course of the 1920s and 1930s. At Stalin's infamous behest in 1937, General Choibosan, here in the center slide, General Choibosan and the party leadership in Mongolia decided that uh, the enduring weaknesses of the socialist state and the enduring power of monastic estates required a turn to legal violence. In just over a year, at least uh, 40,000 monks and other quote unquote counter revolutionaries were tried and shot. Hundreds of thousands more were, in, were imprisoned or disrobed. Mongolia's over 700 monastic complexes and temples were reduced to rubble except save three. And so here was the final blunt answer to the Lama question. I should say Zawadandan died of natural causes just in the midst of all this violence, although he, he saw what was happening. Though Zawadandan was memorialized in Soviet era histories as a unique modernist outlier of an otherwise counter-revolutionary monastic establishment. And this, the reason for that was because they decided he had adopted quote unquote scientific methods in his monastic history writing. And although current revivalists in Mongolia like to remember him as a master of the imperial era monastic tradition, my, my research, as I said, shows that neither are true. During the Qing socialist transition between 1900 and 1936, Zawadamdin and, and his conservative trans-Asian milieu of monks and Chinggisid nobility understood their times in uh, their times in terms that were neither of the Qing nor of the just invented national subject. In general, the conservative nobility and monastic elites uh, such as Aladamdin were overwhelmingly concerned with preserving the integrity and centrality of monasticism in revolutionary inner Asia. Over the course of the 18th and 19th centuries, monastic networks became not only the major sedentary institutions across Eastern Tibet, so Qinghai, Sichuan, uh, places like that, uh, and all Mongolian societies all the way up to Siberia in Tsarist Russia, but also they were the dominant and nearly singular site of medicine, of literacy, of printing, of artistic production, and of course, you know, ritualism, philosophy, and so on. However, in a more interesting and fundamental sense, and this is where much of my project ended up lying, what appeared most at stake for Zawadamdin and his increasingly embattled milieu was the very mechanism of history and sovereignty itself. 
contact, you know, jiao in Tibetan, contact with purifying, always, ma man, uh, sorry, always masculine centers of social, political, and religious reproduction. Here we get to the enduring cultural and social legacies of the Qing imperial formation after its political endings. And here too, we find a landscape of social, political, and religious imagination erased by the hegemony of the national subject and by state violence. And it is this landscape with all its revisionist implications uh, for treating modernization in Asia's heartland, especially in connection to Buddhism that I've really tried to reconstruct uh, in this book. As part of this pressing work to write the Qing ruins into place and time, cosmopolitan monastic elites across the Tibeto-Mongolian and Siberian frontiers like Zawadamdan were very much concerned with engaging newly globalized intellectual traditions arriving from Europe. And sorry, I should say, I'm just giving a, an overview in this talk. If anyone wants to return and talk about the specific versions of, of history um, that Zawadamdan concocted in all these conversations, I'd happily return to this um, in the, in the Q&A afterwards. Uh, so Zawadamdan and those around him were, uh, these monastic scholars were, uh, even though they were very conservative, were very much uh, in, in, in new global conversation. So for example, while polyglot frontier scholastics in Eastern Tibet and Mongolia had long engaged European mathematics, astronomy, cartography, and art via the Jesuits at the Qing court, Zhao Damdun is one of the first, to my knowledge, to engage European humanism. In the pages of a secular newspaper entitled Shini Tov, or the, the New Mirror, that circulated in the autonomous, uh, in Mongolia between 1911 and 19, 1919, and also in engagements with scholars ranging from Russian Buddhologists and diplomats and so on, as I said before, Zawa Damdan and many other monastic leaders deeply engaged and also synthesized European arts and sciences uh, with the scholastic tradition of the Qing. Unlike revolutionary intellectuals, however, these trans inner Asian monastic thinkers used the human sciences, sciences to extend or to subvert received monastic histories from the Qing and also to reinterpret historical and spatial representations in Indian canonical works as varied as the Kalachakra Tantra and the Abhidharma. So to understand how Buddhist monks like Zawadand and understood the Qing ruins, we must understand a particularly, uh, a particular late imperial inner Asian sense of presence in history. So go back to the slide. Uh, in Ocean of Milk, Ocean of Blood, I use the idea of enchantment in a very specific sense to name the dominant object of historical writing in inner Asian monastic his historiography uh, for much of the last millennia, I should say. Uh, this was enlightened agents like Buddhas and Bodhisattvas appearing upon the human stage in the bodies of monastic leaders and temporal rural, uh, rulers. This was a centuries long project along the Sino Tibetan and Mongolian interface to historicize the enchantment of Eurasia, the very event of history the object of monastic histori historiography was the periodic intervention of Buddhas, of the enlightened, in the guise of emperors, khans, and monks upon the human stage. The result, as they saw it, was the abundance of social and salvific possibility manifest in forms as diverse as literacy, law, sacred violence in some cases, and of course, Buddhist monasticism and the promotion of Buddhist forms of self and community cultivation. Turkic, Mongol, Tibetan, Chinese, and Indian communities were known in relation to one another for these monastics through this lens of enlightened intervention. And in the early 20th century treated by my book, so too was the collapse of the Qing and the Tsarist empires. So too was the invasion of Tibet by the British in 1904. So too was the rise of revolutionary nationalism and eventually profound state violence across Asia's heartland, not just in Mongolia, but in Siberia. And then of course, later in the 1950s uh, in, Tibetan, in, in Tibet. This orientation to place and time as moved by contact between enlightened and human actors was more pragmatically a dominant language of diplomacy 
And during the Qing Empire, especially, a way of projecting imperial authority into the inner Asian frontiers, as many scholars have noted. And this was articulated um, in the two systems, a kind of model of unified religious and political authority, the Rukmi or Chisi Zumchao, sort of combination of the Dharma and secular rule, uh, Hoyer Yosu in, in Mongolian. The two systems for Zawa Damdin, as it had been for all of his monastic predecessors, was perfected in the Qing Imperium and in the Qing patronage of the Geluk tradition. This is the tradition of the Dalai Lama, so, uh, the yellow hat tradition that was spread across so much of Inner Asia by the early 20th century. And so this, the memory of this golden age prior to the socialist period, he referred to regularly as the rising tide of a life-giving ocean of milk, it's the Omegatso which had swept across Eurasia's heartland, including even in Mecca and in the pre-Islamic period for him. In the ruins of the Qing, Zawa Damdin's unenviable task was to clarify and to order, these are words he uses, sal and kopa, uh, his revolutionary times. Occasionally, he sought only to appropriately name ruptured temporalities, territories, communities, sovereignties, and religiosities. The range of his intellectual interests were vast, ranging from Chinese history to European mechanical sciences and astronomy. Um, and of course, also things like the Kala Chakra Tantra and Madhyamaka and so on. Yet in all his writings, he remained primarily focused on diagnosing the causes and conditions of what was elsewhere being called the revolutionary modern, but which he referred to only as a toxic life-denying ocean of blood, the Taki Gatso. In, uh, in Tibetan. So my book contains a sort of extensive presentation of Zawa Damdin's alternative historicization of not just inner Asian, but global modern history. And I won't get into it all here. Um, it's, it's all in the book. But in general, Zawa Damdin and his, and his trans-Asian milieu understood the Qing collapse as the product of events in the 19th century. Importantly, not through contact with Europe and not even really through contact with socialism and nothing to do with the modern as, uh, as it's commonly understood. After decades of investigations, Zawa Damdin determined at the end of his life, just before the purges, that the violence and upheavals of socialist state building around him were only symptoms of a much grander world historical narrative of decline one that, of course, we're all familiar with who read Buddhist sources, but that he localized in the post-Qing uh, period. Though deeply engaged with revolutionary forces and state narratives, Zawa Damdin and his otherwise silent milieu set the post-Qing world into time, place, and community without any reference to the empty, homogenous time of the nation, for example, and certainly without contact with Europe as marking some uh, epochal transition to modernity in Asia. These were not at all the categories that he and his milieu used. Okay, so to conclude, so while my book goes some of the way to illum illuminate the desperately creative social and religious imagination of Buddhist monastics making sense of the Qing collapse, the rise of revolutionary nationalism and the erasure of state socialism, I had another larger point that I came to uh, kind of that I wanted to make through writing. Um, this is briefly put, the Buddhist study scholarship has much to contribute to correct a set of biases in the study of modernization and religion in 19th and 20th century Asia. My book, my position in this book and in my broader scholarship is that the story of Buddhism plus modernity and modernization is often organized too neatly between an imperial or a colonial period and its aftermath in inner Asia between a Mongolian and Tibetan or Chinese and European uh, sources and traditions, between the national subject and what it excludes, and definitely organized too, ne too neatly between the arrival of something called the modern, pro uh, by which we often mean progress, self-mastery, social emancipation, science, technology, socialism, academic institutions, democracy, and Europe, and uh, the retreat of the quote unquote traditional by which we often gloss stasis, superstition, other mastery, suppression, folk tradition, Buddhism and shamanism, scholasticism, and Asia. And here I'm kind of talking about the sort of moral narratives that underlie so much of modernity studies. 
And such dualisms, much like the West non-West binary itself, or the neutrality of the secular humanist gaze, or the modernist staging of the West as the site and source of universal knowledge and history, are all simply not defensible. They're not tenable. So for example, in the case study I examine in my book, which I've introduced very briefly um, tonight, the social imagination and active lives of the majority of monastic across, monastics across Inner Asia cannot at all be implauded in the self-descriptive language of a state, right? The language of an emergent nationalism and its narratives of progress and so on. Erstwhile cosmologies guided monastic lives during the modern formation of Inner Asia. And yet we still know so little about them. Zawa Damdan's oeuvre is, uh, oeuvre is just one uh, telling case study. Remarkable, not because of its content, but because of having survived a century of violence. So here is a vast landscape of social and, a re and religious imagination, quite apart from what is recorded in state archives and reducible to neither tradition nor to the modern religion, science, uh, or revolutionary progress. Mm, and the point becomes even clearer. I think the implications, at least for me, became quite clear when we recall the abundant and often quite rigorous scholarship currently available about so-called Buddhist modernism or Protestant Buddhism, something I'm sure many of you are very familiar with. Um, and we're all, you know, we all know the excellent work on modernist innovate, innovators and go-betweens like Lady Saida in Myanmar, Gendon Chopo in Tibet, and of course, D.T. Suzuki in Japan and many, many others. And what has usefully been called a kind of reverse orientalism, progressive Buddhist monks and lay thinkers such as these reimagined the Buddhism already legible to the national subject and already in the, uh, in, in partly in, in the, uh, the discursive frame of romantic orientalism, Protestantism, scientific tastes of West, uh, and the scientific tastes of Western audiences and progressive circles in Asia. Zawa Damdin, by contrast, and thousands more like him, was, uh, was similarly deeply engaged with European sources and with progressive political and religious thinkers, but he came to reject their claims entirely. In order, I hope to vote, motivate some new avenues in the comparative study of Buddhist life in late and post-imperial and colonial Asia, I argue um, in this book that the products of Zawa Damdin's receptions ought to be explored like many, many others like him, ought to be explored as a hybrid, something like a counter-modern Buddhism. David McMahon, uh, McMahon, whose ongoing work on Buddhist modernism remains sort of a milestone and something I'm sure many of you are, uh, of which you're familiar with his work, has aimed in his words, quote, with his studies of Buddhist modernism, has aimed, quote, to illuminate not only how Buddhism's encounter with modernity has changed it, but also how the conditions of modernity have created implicit parameters for what interpretations of Buddhism become possible and impossible. How and why have certain elements of the Buddhist traditions been selected as serving the needs of the modern world, he asks, while others have been ignored or suppressed? How has Buddhism fit into the meta narratives of American or European culture? And I would add, of course, progressive uh, Asian circles and emergent nationalisms, how does Buddhism fit into these meta-narratives and into those of an increasingly globalized modernity? But Zawa Damdin's work, and what I wanted to raise in this book, allows us to reverse these common questions and to ask instead, what elements of monastic and scholarly tradi Buddhist traditions were passed over as serving the needs of the modern world? How have certain monastic and scholastic formations and knowledge traditions and practices remained incommensurable with the meta narratives of a globalized modernity? How do the parameters of enlightenment derived modernities from Europe exile certain formulations of the subject and of time, of territory, community, and religious religiosity, but not others? Hybrid countermodern Buddhisms like Zawadamans do not occupy the territory of religion or the political, of the private or the public, of the imperial colonial or its aftermath, or of the renounced monk or the nationalist, national citizen. They exceed the national subject. They exceed national histories and territories and forms of uh, agency and power. 
The national subject, uh, which Prasanjit Dwara reminds us, remains a major impediment to the doing of Asian cultural history. In Zawa Damdan's oeuvre and in hundreds of other figures like him, many of whom may be uh, familiar to some of you, across late and post-colonial and imperial Asia, everything was crisis and open disorienting possibility. And so by attending to their work with clear eyes, I wanted to suggest or argue in this book, we might more rigorously diversify the personal and global stories that have made up the diversity of Buddhist life between and beyond uh, empire and nation, the modern and tradition, religion and science, and the West and non-West. Such analysis might also position Buddhist scholars to lead and not simply echo movements to decolonize the doing of the humanities and to decenter Europe and European expectations in the doing of the humanities uh, and provide resources to others for a critical and even radical uh, form of humanist analysis. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Dr. King. You give you give us a very more like a, an outline of your book and uh, a lot of things. It seems like we need to really read your book, you know, to grab the the landscape you describe to us, you know, all kind of material, all kind of historical period. It's so diverse, you know. So I believe this book actually is a kind of the work I believe we call scholarship. We devote our time and energy to work on such diverse uh, data and material. So now is our time to uh, present our question to Dr. King. So anyone uh, want to uh, give uh, your question uh, to Dr. King about his book or his uh, scholarship or his uh, idea about how to make such uh, research? Anyone? Mm, okay, before anyone to think about, yes, Dr. Lancaster. <coughs> Thank you very much. That, that was, I'm still trying to absorb what you've just told us. Very uh, complex and, and very detailed uh, and intricate systems interacting with each other. Um, I wonder if, if you have any thoughts about when similar things may have occurred to Buddhists in the past history. Mm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, I would say that the past moments that mattered most for the authors who I examine in this book and others than Zawadamd and who I look at in, in other uh, research. Um, of course, the UN period mattered a lot, the Mongol Empire and its, um, you know, the, the reign of Kublai Khan and so on mattered in the abundant ways, um, not only for authorizing a certain type of political formation or certain visions of, say, Buddhism in relationship to uh, the state or local communities, but a sort of precursor for the type of cosmopolitanism that I really have come to think about as the field that I'm most interested in. Um, in other words, the sort of mm, uh, diversification of the scholastic college from Tibet, um, you know, where monks would study philosophy and ritualism and so on, brought into and being this, this sort of intellectual avant-garde in a way of needing to synthesize, say, Chinese, well, say, let's say first the Mongol Empire with Tibetan sources and, and the, the, the heritage of Central Asian and Indian um, canonical and exegetical traditions and history. Um, where were the Mongols and, and where was the Mongol Empire and the topography of the Kalachakra Tantra and the Abhidharma, for example. And then, of course, the, the next major moment, another globalizing, 
uh, cosmopolitan one was the resolution of the Song Mongol War. Um, this is the a war raging in central Tibet that, that ends in 1642, that allows the institution of the Dalai Lama to rise, the great fifth Dalai Lama, um, you know, at the same time that the Qing is forming in 1644. And it's not immediately the case that there are deep institutional relationships between the Gandhi and Pultron government, the institution of the Dalai Lamas, um, but it very soon begins to happen that mass monasticism, that the, um, the institution of incarnate Lamas and so on be, is, is just dramatically deployed across Eastern Tibet and, and China and Mongolian societies. And what's very interesting there is not simply that monasticism was founded, it's that many of these monks were acting as go-betweens. It's really a synthetic go-between sort of tradition of monks working across Mongol and Chinese and Manchu and Tibetan frames to sort of, um, you know, basically write the world, like write, <laughs> write into in scholastic writing and, and, and work. Uh, and this was the case whether they were, you know, working in the court in Beijing in the Lifan Yuan or something and kind of managing managing the bureaucracy of the empire or in central Tibet, or whether they were just um, a series of boundary institution monks who were kind of managing all of these competing sources. So I guess I would say that in terms of events, the, the um, Mongol Empire, uh, the, the Tibetan Empire distantly in the 8th century, but the Mongol Empire in the 13th and the founding of the Qing em Empire in the 17th century were central, but, but only because it allowed, it, it, these were scholastic precursors for winding together all of these histories, right? Chinggis Khan was already bound to memories of Sam Mahasamati, the you know, in India, <laughs> and uh, there was already sort of a, an entire, I, I guess, a cosmology, if you want to say, of, of binding, you know, uh, Chinese history with Turkic history and so on. Um, and the, and these were the resources that Zawa Damdan used to sort of um, to not go on too long. This is, this is the frame that he used to, to diagnose uh, and name what was happening in the, in the ruins of the chain. Even as he engaged, you know, uh, Marxist thinkers and, and, and science scientists and, and other progressive kind of, and, and, and early Buddhist studies scholars as well. Thank you. I, I, I mean, it, it brings up for me the the issues I think that we face as Buddhist scholars today, because I think every era, don't you feel, has been one of great change. Yeah, that's <laughs> and, certain. <laughs> and things become that are central at one period of time become absolutely tossed aside at, at another time. And uh, I'm not always sure that it's it's... <laughs> It is a progression toward perfection. It seems to me that these sometimes are successful and sometimes not. I would, yeah, I would certainly agree. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Dr. Chu, uh, Dr. Chu, you have a question? Uh, Dr. Chu is also is the, our uh, faculty in the religious department. Oh, hi. Nice to meet you, Dr. Chu. Nice meeting you too, Dr. King. Uh, that was just absolutely informative. Beautifully oh. done. Thank you. So a lot of uh, brand new information for me. Now, I understand that historically, Mongolia served as a sort of a buffer zone between the power dynamics between China and Tibet. Mm -hmm. And we know that uh, in Qing Dynasty, for example, uh, Emperor Qianlong uh, tried to manipulate the quote-unquote reincarnation situation in Mongolia, seeing to that reincarnation of uh, the prominent lamas can only take place in Tibet as opposed to in Mongo. So I was wondering if you can make a few comments about how these uh, historical dynamics uh, pertain to contemporary issues, you know, things like mm -hmm. uh, the Chinese government continues to interfere in the quote-unquote reincarnation situation, mm -hmm. basically nowadays requiring the Dalai Lama to have to be reborn again in mm -hmm. Tibet and therefore, you know, ostensibly making himself amenable to communist con control. Mm -hmm. uh, 
so what do you think is the Mongolian role in all of this? Could they say conceivably provide a sort of um, spiritual safe haven for the Dalai Lama's mm. subsequent rebirth or, you know, how, how would they continue to, to uh, play the role of a buffer zone? So mm. Mm. Thank you, that's a wonderful question. Um, there's a few uh, perspectives on that. I'll try to just say briefly. One is that, you're of course absolutely right that Mongolia was was a, was used as a buffer, and in, yes, in many ways, Tibet was used as a buffer uh, to <laughs> to stamp out the rise of any kind of central charismatic authority in Mongolia that would challenge the Qing as well. Um, and it's no coincidence that when the British invade um, Tibet, it's it's to Mongolia where the thirteenth Dalai Lama first flees for two years. Right? Um, these were closely connected societies at the time. Um, but I will say that. In this time now, it's a quite more, it's much more of a complicated situation because you have an emergent, I would say almost like a hyper-nationalism in Mongolia, one that is really wanting to recover its golden age prior to um, the Soviet period and prior even to the sort of embarrassment of the Qing um, sort of conquest of Mongolian societies. Um, a sort of Mongol independence that uh, faces complexities because its Buddhist traditions, of course, are so beholden to Tibet. Still, if you go to Ulaanbaatar, to the monasteries, monks will be reading prayers for you and your children in Tibetan. Um, all the movements to reform and to kind of, you know, do things even in Mongolian have basically failed. Um, and if you want an education as a monk, you need to go to, you know, to the... the uh, Tibetan monasteries in exile, um, and so on. Um, but so there's a dependency in Mongolia upon Tibet, but it's a one that is widely sort of detested. And there's a there's a constant move to to find ways of being independent from Tibet from Tibet, in terms of its Buddhist traditions and social and and um, intellectual and political histories um, that are major blockages. And I will say that although of course there's much devotion to the Dalai Lama in Mongolia. And many of the revived monasteries are sort of centered symbolically around him and the major uh, Tibetan monasteries that have been established in South India. Um, that's an uneven one. And in, there's been times where the Dalai Lama has publicly questioned, for example, Mongolian abbots who have children, you know, many Mongolian monks sort of buck the norm in the broader Tibetan tradition and don't really keep celibacy at all. They'll have children and wives and so on including even abbots. And so the, the Dalai Lama has publicly rebuked the Mongols for, for this and, and it's caused outrage in Mongolia, just sort of like who needs these old Tibetan Lamas, you know, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so I would just say that there's a, the, the emergent hyper-nationalism in Mongolia, which is really hard to overstate, um, which is founded also in an, anti, uh, an anti-Chinese sediment that is also hard to overstate. Um, causes a bit of complications there. Um, but I would say that uh, to your earlier question about the 1793 decree by Qianlong and so on about, you know, um, yes, sure, not, not only finding Mongol lamas in Tibet and also, you know, imposing rules like the golden urn and so on and so forth. Um, there are really interesting histories there. Um, ones that I think have been told largely from the perspective of Manchu and Chinese sources, but not often from the perspectives, uh, perspectives of Mongolian and Tibetan monasteries who were supposedly following along. Because <laughs> in fact, I don't think they were. And if you look at lists of the many uh, lamas, like say the various Dalai Lamas and the Karmapas and Panchen Lamas and so on that were supposedly found using the golden urn. If you read their Tibetan biographies, including biographies written by, and, uh, written by witnesses to events, um, there's a much more trick kind of complicated process going on there in terms of who was wielding power to reproduce these figureheads of these institutions. And it was one that I would say largely lay with locals and hardly with the Qing state uh, in most cases. Um, whereas, you know, the golden urn was really just certifying choices that had already been made quite independently. Um, and so on. So, um, you know, the, the Tibetan perspective, of course, on these moves currently for the socialist government of China to sort of lay claim to be able to name the enlightened in the world, uh, of course, is, is uh, 
is complex, but there's not, you know, there's abundant work written about, um, you know, this is a historically fraught claim to think that China had any centralizing, that, that the Qing, we shouldn't say China, that the Qing empire had any real centralized control outside of those times when their armies were in Inner Asia, had any sustained, sustained control on the shape of those traditions. They, you know, the, the more sure-footed historical claim is how much they patronized the spread of mass monasticism through these areas. Um, you know, that was really a place where the Qing state, you know, endured. But, um, you know, what's going to happen is this Dalai Lama will pass away and there'll be a Dalai Lama in China and the Tibetans in exile will name their Dalai Lama. That's absolutely what's going to happen. And um, the Mongols will not choose, <laughs> it will not be Mongol. And I would say that any incarnations in Mongolia have, have been so, um, they've had to be hidden away. The politics there are so, so crazy that I think we'll have a, I think we'll have a Dalai Lama in the exile community in Tibet and also one in China. Sorry, that's a long run on answer to, uh, to uh, your- That's absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Thank you for your great question. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Yuamola and uh, Dr. Jian Yuamola is our, also is faculty in religious department and currently she serves as a CAO for our university. Hello. Dr. Yuamola. Hi, Matt. Hi. Thank you so much for your um, wonderful talk and the book. And um, I'm glad we've had the opportunity to hear more about it. And I guess my question, it, it's a, in a little different vein. Um, I really like the way you are faithful to Zava Damden. Hmm. Um, and your focus on Zava Damden, I like the way that, I really appreciate the way it disrupts and complicates the narrative of Buddhist modernism. Hmm. Um, and I think it's absolutely important, as you say, to maybe kind of reshift to see what we have lost or haven't seen because of the theoretical frameworks that we, we use to look at um, Buddhist history. Um, along that vein, <laughs> I was wondering if going back to Zavadabdin, and I know you, know, you can't do the entire book in, in the talk, but I was wondering if you could just say a little more about, um, I was really intrigued by, by one sentence you had, which was, um, the, how is uh, Zava Damden viewed the collapse of the Qing? You, mm. you mentioned that it was symptoms of the decline of a larger history. And I'm wondering if you could take us into those like thousands of pages you've read of his work and maybe get, you know, paint a, you know, a, a sketch a picture of what that history looked like. Sure, thank you very much. Um, and thank you so much for uh, your encouraging words. I'm glad a little bit of the project was, uh, is clear and I'm excited that, that, uh, that, it, that it is. Um, I guess, you know, maybe two, let me say two things about that, that history. And, you know, I just, his works were never completed and you have, lit you know, you have his handwriting or his scribe's handwriting in between the lines. He's present so much. It would be like one, like one of us, um, publishing a, a, you know, a, a draft, a, a revised draft of something that's far away from publication. So I should say that nothing's really tied up with a bow. He doesn't have definitive state. You kind of have to, it's through accretion, through reading colophons and, and editorial notes and, and, and so on and so forth that these, these stories kind of can begin to congeal. But one that was really interesting for me that departed from the sort of stock historical narratives you would find in the 18th and 19th century in these kind of frontier Gaelic monastic histories was an, uh, uh, sort of the bottom falling out on the deep his historical perspective on this con on contemporary issues. And what is so fascinating is that the sources to tell a bigger story about the deep history of Eurasia actually, but, uh, but of quote unquote Buddhist history in, in inner Asia, that, that deep history came from two sources. One was um, the translation of more and more Chinese works into Tibetan and Mongolian, um, you know, uh, uh, including Fa Xian's narrative, which actually my current book, which is I'm finishing up, is exploring in its trans circulation into Tibetan Mongolia and so on. Um, so many Chinese sources, you know, sort of through this Qing polylingual, you know, uh, process of producing reference works and, you know, creating equivalencies between Uyghur and Mongol, Tibetan and Chinese. 
uh, sources. So there was sort of a, a Chinese histories were brought into conversation with say Mongolian Chinggisid genealogies and Tibetan and Indian sources in new ways. So that was important to kind of hatch out, you know, uh, a vision of how Buddhism came to China and how to make that into more of a Mongolian story. But really the, the most exciting development and most original one to Dawa Damden was Silk Road discoveries actually. Um, so Pelio and others, um, he was looking at, he talks about looking at pictures of excavations from Khotan, for example, in the Tarim Basin, um, looking at, um, he's reading and actually translates in full uh, John Gustav uh, Ramstead's, um, oh geez, work on, uh, it's an article about the Turkic origins of the Mongols based on reading not Stella, but sort of these rock engravings, basically a, like a Finnish Altaic linguistics and archaeology. <laughs> Suddenly that's being read against, you know, the Parinirvana Sutra and stuff like that. Um, and he, he's translating it uh, because it was being translated into sort of Mongolian as part of this secular socialist drive to educate uh, and sort of invent a nationalist history. Zawa Damdin's picking pieces and, and those in his milieu and rereading canonical sources in their light to very, very, very different ends. So basically you get, you know, it was lo had long been held by Mongols that they were the ones that brought Buddhism to, the, to China, for example. That was something that had occurred in the previous century by these go-between monks, um, that they were the ones who had given the quote unquote golden man to those ch early Chinese ex uh, expeditions that brought about, you know, that story. They had sort of Mongolized the story. Dawa Damdan though is able to use all these Silk Road excavations to claim that the Mongols were also the ones that brought Buddhism to history. Uh, sorry, I'm sorry, brought Buddhism to Tibet in the eighth century, um, which is more than just a sort of, you know, uh, insider baseball kind of uh, note of interest because it allows them to really reverse um, engineer a lot of historical processes, right? Because through a lot of different intellectual strategies, the Khotanese become Mongol, basically everyone north of the, north of the Great Wall. <laughs> and west of China is Mongol, including um, those who become Muslim, including the inhabitants of Mecca. And that really allows him to reread the Kala Chakra, Tantra, and so forth. Um, but specifically, again, around this central protagonist of this type of monastic writing, which is human communities that experience periodically enlightened beings playing the roles of monks and khans and emperors. Um, and so uh, that deep history is read in that vein. And that allows him to sort of create the long, long story of contact with the enlightened that had, he decided, come undone in his time. But it had not come undone when the revolutionary government started. It did not come undone when the Republican, when Republican China started, it came undone for him. Those were all just sort of like um, uh, symptoms of something that was already rotted, of a, of a departure, of an absence. And for him, that, is, that began in the 19th century through this um, set of prophecies that he re reinterprets and basically the settling of Ulaanbaatar and all of these previously mobile monastic complexes and um, he says that basically the advice of the enlightened were not followed. And he, it's a very long story, but he basically comes up with a 19th century, um, what I guess genealogy to what was elsewhere being called modernist, you know, revolutionary liberation. Um, and, and then he's able to kind of diagnose the moral, political and social um, decay around him in those terms. And there he's really using stuff we're, we're all familiar with who read Buddhist sources about the decline of the Sangha, you know, upturned social hierarchy, you know, the age of decline type narratives. But it's really tied explicitly to, um, pardon me, new possibilities open to him in this newly globalized intellectual uh, environment. And, and the very last thing I'll say is that he's writing it also not just in global history, but the whole other side of that story is the way he's working with these different genres of biographical writing that have to do in inner Asia with between secret inner and outer types of biographical writing that have their different audiences. It's its own story, but if you follow the way he moves between these modes of writing himself, there, there's this whole polemic against the modern period that, that emerges. And, and, and why you have to read so subtly is because he never names the revolutionary government in, it was too dangerous to do that. He never, he stops naming political figures in the year 1900. 
Um, and so it becomes this, this very coded kind of, but very deep and sustained critique that, that sort of illuminates this, these entirely other orientations to time and place and agency that um, surely I think were just found across the changing late imperial and colonial kind of world of Asia, Buddhist Asia. Um, sorry, it's a long-winded answer, but there's, there's so many other details I'm trying to just not get lost in my, <laughs> in my answer, yeah. but thank you, thank you for the question. <laughs> Yeah, no, thank you. I'm just, my mind is blown. Thank you. <laughs> Any other question? Yes, Bong. Dr. King, thank you for your lecture. Uh, I wanted to ask a question from a student's perspective. Uh, you apparently, I mean, it's, it's clear you did a lot of research and uh, a lot of creative research, clearly. Um, what advice do you would you have for students like myself and my classmates who are um, need to figure out how to deal with revisionist history, which mm. you you seem to have dealt with pretty well? Um, well, thank you. I, I, <laughs> um, well, I, here's what I think, um, and what I tell graduate students that I am working with. Uh, as much as I can. I mean, I do think that old adage that if you want to be a specialist, you need to be a good generalist really holds true for us in Buddhist studies. And I think that the, um, I'm sure we would all agree that the, and certainly in fact, your, your departments and institutes and university is an example of this, of how many vital contributions the Buddhist world and scholars of Buddhism have for ongoing conversations in the humanities, right? Not where we're not simply, um, you know, applying theory produced in continental Europe to, you know, fit Buddhist Asia into that hole and, you know, we've done it, but actually looking at our sources in ways that revise and extend and trouble and exceed and so on, um, assumptions of all these Enlightenment era kind of um, Enlightenment era like holdovers that continue to organize the humanities. Not least being, of course, the fact that, <laughs> you know, the humanities are so beholden to the reproduction of the, the West and the modern as sort of site and source for the universal. So, you know, that uh, there's a, you know, that, that old point of why is theory never produced from Asian sources? It's only ever applied to it. That's a really great question. It has a lot to do with the colonial history of the humanities, I would say and the way that our departments and jobs and fields are continue to be organized. That and also the, I think the troubling kind of combination of the ethno-national subject with Buddhism, Japanese Buddhism, Mongolian Buddhism. I mean, there's purpose to that, obviously. There's languages involved and all sorts of other histories and, and political formations. Um, but there's also a presumption that comes out of area studies <laughs> and the politics of the 20th century that also obscure as much as they illuminate. And we're all people that have worked so hard for so long to learn how to read these sources and these languages and we see the subtleties. And, you know, I think we can really occupy those shadows in ways that um, are, spe are challenging direct, very directly a lot of presumptions. And this isn't just about, you know, Christianity or, you know, or the dominance of the West. This is about like, what do we, as what do we assume, like the whole metaphysics of the modern as Amy Allen calls it, why do we assume that Time is that the perpetual progress seems, seems natural, you know? <laughs> can we justify empiricism? What other models of knowing the past, you know, can we explore? You know, there's just so many, and, and those are all being explored very broadly across the humanities and, you know, this kind of congealing conversation around the critical Asian humanities that I think um, Buddhist studies scholars are very ripe to be not just engaging with, but leading actually. And, you know, and this is very much the same with decolonizing. Again, not just naming, not just naming the European genealogy of our analytical categories, but like, what is the territory outside of them? <laughs> what are other ways of doing the humanities that do not reproduce the modernist uh, staging of the West and its epistemic forms, its forms of epistemic sovereignty? Well, we all have those resources. Jeez, we've done all the work. So I think that if we, are as students and 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 you know uh, and wherever we are in our in our in our research and maybe continuously, I think to to get a sense of some of those conversations uh, and join them boldly, very boldly, in light of our sources, um, is vital. And you know, this obviously many 
many, many scholars in Buddhism are very engaged with the humanities. I'm not pretending that this is like a completely novel idea, but I do think that our, I, you know, I do think there are crises in the humanities that are good crises, good trouble about reconsidering really. And, you know, I look at sister disciplines to ours like indigenous studies, uh, feminist and queer theory who have long, all long staged, really sustained critiques to the as, as, assumptions in the production of knowledge in the humanities. And I think like, why not a critical Buddhist studies, you know? And I really think that um, in addition to the abundant language work and man, much training we must do in our sources, that should be part of our graduate training in Buddhist studies too, is, is critique actually, not just, okay, I read Foucault so I can like use the word in an intro, <laughs> you know, not, you know, actually like original, innovative, self-propelling critique that arrive, that kind of allowing our sources to bite back and determine, um, you know, broader challenges in the humanities. I think that it's not that much of a, that big of a project. We're, we're all kind of there already. We just uh, have to rethink our audiences a bit. And I really think this is a great time to um, be doing that because all of our disciplines are, um, you know, facing good crises uh, more and more. Whose story are we telling, you know? Um, and so that's, uh, we, should, we should speak to the broadest audience we can when we are answering that question, I'd say. And, you know, as graduate students, finally, with the market being the way it is, we have to be generalists going out on the market, you know what I mean? And one of the best ways to do that is to, to be reading alongside our, our other studies, um, you know, some of this work that, you know, allows you to critique forms of agency that are assumed or the types of history that we just take on and don't question or whatever, you know? That's a great way to talk to a scholar outside of our field when we're on the job market and, and uh, as we're proposing classes and stuff that are of this moment in universities, uh, public, well, in, in universities today. Thank you for inspiring us to be good troublemakers. Yes, yeah, that's a great way of saying it. <laughs> well, you know, uh, personally, I'm the Dr. King students. <laughs> Dr. King is a member of my dissertation community. Mm -hmm. I owe a lot of debt to the Dr. King. So let me ask the, my previous asked the question, okay? Because now, especially follow the phone's question about the graduate student. Mm -hmm. But actually like uh, for, for example, in our UCR, we don't have uh, a lot of monastic students. No. But majority of our University of West the student population is a monastic. Mm -hmm. So Dr. King, can you just give uh, some advice to our monastic student how they study their own tradition. Because like, for example, um, that, that your topic talk about uh, intellectual genealogy about a particularly monastic figure, especially like uh, in past uh, 100 years. So it's more mm -hmm. like uh, for the monastic student, it's look like uh, if they want to study their own teacher, or mm -hmm. if they want to study their own hero in their tradition, do you have any suggestion to the monastic uh, student how they dealing with this kind of the researcher role and the disciple role? I know it's very, you mm -hmm. know, sometimes it's very hard for our monastic student to mm -hmm. manage this kind of the, we call uh, scholarship, the research, the position. So mm -hmm. do you have any suggestion to our monastic student? No, that's a great question. Um, I, you know, here's what I think of, first of all, um, which is in my, in my book, you know, I, I spent time in these communities for many, many, many years. Uh, you know, I was fed by them. You know, I called the, the mother, the mother of the incarnation of current incarnation, I, you know, Amala, mother, you know, um, and uh, the community I knew really well. They helped me in, you know, when I was sick out there and we did a lot for each other. I raised a lot of money for that. It was before graduate school. Like, you know, I went there as in the company of a Tibetan Lama who was their teacher, you know. So, um, you know, it was a, which is just to say that, and, and, and I was telling us as I began looking at these sources, not only did I begin seeing stories that were very different from the ones that they were telling as part of their strategies to revive a kind of nationalist version of their tradition, I was also telling stories that were quite different from the way that they've wanted to remember violence in living memory. So this is complicated territory. You know, I really 
really didn't, I really do take that seriously. And I, yeah, I, I really had to say in the book and, and in person, like, this is not the book that anyone, any of you thought that I would write. <laughs> um, and it's one that I very humbly say is, is, is not the one you want to tell, you know, and, um, and, and, and so on. And to not, I don't take that lightly that, that uh, it's, it's not just a, an object of intellectual inquiry for them, that, you know, it's, it's, it's what their uncle did to their, their dad or their grandfather. Do you know what I mean? We need to take this. This is also, you know, thinking about these modernist periods, we're also working in profound, in many cases, profound in, in, you know, violence ridden moments of erasure and silencing that is also very complex to work in. And we, of course we must have respect. So all that's just, and I should say that, you know, that through the course of this book, like it, I, a lot of those relationships were not maintained, you know? So like I, it was, I, you know, I, I'm not really in those circles at all anymore, unfortunately. Um, so all of that is what comes to my mind with that question. And, and I do think that, um, you know, writing about your own, I can only imagine the complexities. And of course, many colleagues and friends of mine who are monastics and Buddhist studies who write about their own traditions find it difficult. So, I mean, I don't know if I have like a program on how to write about one's abbot or one's guru or the founder of one's tradition exactly. But what I do, maybe what does come to my mind is back to my, what came to my mind with Fong's question, which was that there are so many topics that histories of our of these traditions, even ones that we're in, um, that that have I think really radical implications for broader conversations in religious studies and in the humanities. So, um, you know, even if you're not trying to tell a non-hagiographic po portrait of an abbot or something, well, what were the forms of education organized by that abbot, or what were the sort of revive or um, transitions in the formation of um, lay monastic relations in, in a particular moment? And how does that change the way we think of the political modern in sort of standard modernity studies or whatever? You know what I mean? I just think that any of these communities are gonna have details that in fact, we're very privileged to know for those of us who are lucky enough to be monastics in a community um, that I think you know might be directed fruitfully elsewhere um, as kind of critique and so on, even if the histories themselves you know, don't need to be some, you know, expose or whatever. I think you can do, I think you can maintain, uh, and, I, and I'm thinking of my friends and colleagues who've done this, not, I, I have no experience, but to be, you know, very embedded as a monastic in a tradition fully and to be doing scholarly work, work you know, like, I mean, I grew up in those communities and, and still maintain them and you can wear two different hats, I think, but that hat that, it's the navel gazing type of Buddhist studies that's a bit troubling there. But I think that if you're thinking about your insider status as being, is allowing you to give a really deep, rich, textured story of your community or some element of its history, you know, the, the, the audience can be elsewhere. Um, you could be troubling and, and pushing back on certain expectations, especially for those of us thinking in the, about the last 100 or 200 years. Um, you can, yeah, you can produce tr trouble outside the monastery, <laughs> not inside. <laughs> Anyways, I don't know, I'm kind of rambling on, but I, I don't really know. In fact, I would actually much prefer to hear one of your monastic colleagues and students tell me what they think, but um, that's just what comes to my, my mind. Thank you, Dr. King, because you let me remember when I was the student, I always loved to challenge our <laughs> professor, faculty, to yes. that kind of question. Yeah, I mean, that is a kind of the training for the graduate student. So any other question? Any other question? Now, uh, we have a uh, uh, hundred minutes for this book talk. And uh, I believe uh, as a couple, uh, our faculty and students say it's overwhelming, okay? They, we need time to digest and reflect what we learned tonight from Dr. King. So actually we are thank you Dr. King and give uh, his time, devote his time to help us, to help us to see an alternative way to doing what we call Buddhist study or another way to doing what we call textual study. So I believe that is a legacy we, 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 can, we can receive, heritage we can receive from Dr. King. Well, so, I, uh, yeah. I just want to say thank you all so much. And I, I hope that this connection means that in the post-pandemic world, our two institutions, we can be 
visiting each other. And I'd love to be meeting all of you in person and for our students at UCR to be you know, coming to events at your campus, we can be building Buddhist studies networks. Maybe this is the start to that. So thank you so much for the invitation and for all of your wonderful questions. It's been, been lovely. Okay, so thank you everyone, especially Dr. Lancaster and all the faculty and the student coming. And I wish everyone have a peaceful night and a happy weekend. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Okay.